Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome at CC, hello and welcome at one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. There we go, rolling. I've been making this project for 25% of my waking life. So there's definitely, you have to be committed to the story and to the idea, you have to care about it. Like it has to be the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning and the last thing you think about before you go to bed at night. You can't think about it as being something that's gonna make you any money because it isn't. Uh, it's something that you do because you care passionately about it and because it's a story that you, you wanna tell. In some ways, you know, I was only able to do this because Cambodia is quite affordable to live and there's a lot of other work you can find in the region so I could tread water and be based there. You know, so you have to make, you have to be prepared to make a lot of lifestyle sacrifices if you want to do something like this. But I think there's a direct correlation between the amount of time you spend on something and the quality of the material that you get out of it at the end. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 79. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. I speak with you today from Asheville, North Carolina, where my family and I have been for a few days now. Prior to that, we were in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we had the pleasure of putting on a workshop and then holding a meetup, which was hosted by the Charlotte Film School. Steph and I were very impressed with the people of Charlotte that we met. Lovely, friendly people who have lots going on and seem to be pretty happy doing it. We might have been less impressed with the construction and kind of a mess of an infrastructure as that city really seems to be building very quickly and on the fly. But Charlotte was great. The workshop went really well. And actually, it gets us very inspired to do more workshops like this. In fact, in late July, the evening of the 25th to be precise, we'll be in Philadelphia giving another workshop. Definitely look forward to that. There will be no true opening segment for this week's program due to all of this travel that we're doing this week and the next. Actually, next week we'll be in Minneapolis giving a filmmaking workshop to a company that's located there. So we're going to get right to today's conversation with the Doc Industry guest. But just before we do that, I do want to mention that next week will be our second annual look at the film festival for the documentary filmmaker. You might remember that last year, right around this time, we ran a two-part special on the Documentary Film Festival as seen through the eyes of a film festival director and a filmmaker who was part of that festival. We highlighted our special with a conversation with Melbourne Documentary Film Festival's director, Lyndon Stone, as well as two filmmakers who were a part of last year's festival. And this year, we'll be doing something quite similar. It will be a two-part special once again, led by Lyndon, as well as parts of conversations with filmmakers Tony Ziera and Don Mickelson. And we'll be taking an even more in-depth look at how and why a documentary film festival functions, as well as we'll be getting some suggestions from filmmakers who have had their films picked to be a part of these festivals. These conversations have already been recorded, and I really can't wait to begin sharing them with you starting with part one next week. 
Okay, just after our break, we're going to have a very special conversation with filmmaker Chris Kelly, who spent six years living and filming in some of the more tumultuous, politically charged areas of the country of Cambodia. But more than that, we'll also be sharing this conversation with the Venerable Loon Sovat, a Cambodian monk who stood up for what he believed in when he himself began putting his own life at risk when he also filmed the very same political events. If you've ever thought about doing documentary work in potentially unsafe or tension-filled environments, then you're going to love today's program. Thanks again for joining us for today's episode. And don't forget to check out the show notes for the program by going to thedocumentarylife.com. Our conversation with Chris Kelly and the Venerable Lewin Sovat is just around the corner. If you're anything like me, you appreciate a good checklist. I've got all kinds of checklists in my life. Every night, I'm creating my to-do list for the next day. Whenever we go camping, I have a camping checklist. Whenever I go out on a shoot, I have a checklist with all of the gear, shots, and b-roll that I'll need. So one day, I thought to myself, why not some kind of checklist for doc filmmakers? And so I came up with one. It's called the Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist, and it's completely free to any doc filmmaker who wants to learn the essential aspects of making a documentary film in the modern day industry. I am all about empowering documentary filmmakers, and this course does just that. It is my sincere hope that this free course will help make your doc film's journey truly the exhilarating and rewarding experience that it can and should be. Enroll today for free by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. So I'm excited and honored today to bring on not just one guest, but two guests on the Documentary Life podcast. Initially, I had set out to speak with documentary filmmaker Chris Kelly, and Chris informed me, much to my delight, that we were going to also have another special guest today, one of the chief subjects of his current documentary film, A Cambodian Spring, is the Venerable Luan Savat. So we will be welcoming both Chris and and the Venerable to the program today. Gentlemen, I'm very excited to have you here and have this conversation on the documentary life. Thank you and Okun. Thank you very much for having us. I'm very pleased to be here as well. I I would be lying if I did not admit that this is a little bit, uh, this conversation is a little bit of a self-indulgence in some ways for me. Um, (laughs) Though we haven't had a lot of people certainly come on the program um, speaking about the country of Cambodia I mention it quite often. It is Cambodia. Southeast Asia is a place where I've done any number of my listeners will tell you I've done a lot of my commercial and documentary work in Southeast Asia, primarily in Nepal, as well as Cambodia. And Cambodia has really become um, a bit of a home away from home for me of sorts since I started doing documentary work there back in 2004. And so um, while it is a little bit of self-indulgence, um, there is going to be so much to offer in having this conversation uh, with both of you gentlemen today. Um, and a lot of the context that we'll be speaking from, of course, will be coming from a place of your direct experience. And this is for the both of you, your direct experience on this unbelievable and amazing documentary film called A Cambodian Spring. Oh, thank you. And Chris, I think a great way to start this initially is I would love to hear um, for you, how did work, film work in Southeast Asia, how did this first start happening for you? Yeah, um, I I mean, I've been making films since uh, 2001, been working in some capacity in the film industry, but I went and traveled to across Southeast Asia in 2006 and spent a few months in Cambodia. I stayed on the lake, the Bangkok Lake, when it was still a lake. Uh, that was the main, it was very picturesque and very peaceful. And so back then, you know, I was interested in the country and what was going on. 
in Cambodia, I was obviously very fascinated by the history and the kind of the you know the genocide that had happened there, and the fact that pretty much anyone you meet over the age of about if they has survived a genocide either as a, a victim or as a perpetrator so it has this very unique uh, uh, history and I found that quite fascinating as a filmmaker and so I started to look for story ideas that I could maybe make a film on and a lot had been done on the history and the past and the Khmer Rouge and the genocide and everything but nobody was really looking at what was going on in present day Cambodia I didn't think and so I started to look at some of the issues that were facing people right now and the main one that came up certainly was land rights and forced evictions um, you know it affects more than 750,000 people uh, across the country and it's just a, a country that an economy that's developing rapidly it's one of the most rapidly growing economies in the world so uh, they have this but they have this very uh, destructive and non-inclusive development model that they seem to be following. So I went back to Ireland with the idea that I would make a film about land grabbing in Cambodia and then put together a proposal, a funding proposal, and, and applied for some development funding from Northern Ireland Screen and the Irish Film Board back in Ireland and was fortunate enough to be able to get that just off of uh, a paper application. Wow. And so went back to... Um, Cambodia in 2009 with a camera, myself and my brother, to look for participants to shoot what at that time was going to be a kind of social issue documentary with lots of sit down interviews and expert analysis and, you know, film some protests and things, but kind of very much a kind of a fly in, shoot a doc and fly out again kind of approach is, is what I was rather naively thinking I was going to be. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to blow our budget on a, on a, on a really high uh, high end cinematographer mm. um, and you know make this kind of glossy somewhat one dimensional uh film but once arriving in Cambodia um and looking for subjects to to film I very quickly met the venerable Savat he was at a press conference filming his community with a little Nokia camera phone this was like pre smartphone days mm. uh, I thought oh, I'd be interested as a filmmaker you know to follow somebody else who was also a filmmaker, you can kind of reflect on the role that documentary film can play in the wider sort of political landscape and reflect on our own art form as well at the same time. Um, so I started working with The Venerable and then I started uh, filming with some of the people at Bangkok Lake as well. And it just became apparent that, you know, these things were happening every day right in front of me. Stuff was, there was protests, there were forced evictions, people were being kicked off their land, people were being relocated miles outside of the city. The Venerable was traveling all over the country trying to secure the release of his family and villagers who were being held in prison over a land dispute. And so it just didn't make sense to me to try and tell the story through interview when I could, if I decided to stay, I could capture it happening you know in real time and so that's right. what precipitated that change in approach and change in tact and i think a slight maturing in terms of ideas of what it is that an outsider can do and what kind of story an outsider can tell in a country like cambodia you know it, it, i i realized that i needed to to find something universal in the story rather than just making a, a probably overly simplistic mm. Uh, land rights film. I started to look at something that embraced the complexity and ambiguity of what I found in the country. Well, it's interesting because, and there's a couple of things that we can unravel there, Chris. You know, I've been working in developing countries, as I mentioned earlier, off and on since about 2004. And mm -hmm. and land grab and land rights is definitely a, uh, it's an issue wherever you go often in developing countries. Now in Cambodia, land grabs often meant sort of the border areas and the Vietnamese and the Thais. And so it's interesting to hear of land grab in this sort of context with which you're speaking with Cambodian uh, the Cambodian government working with corporations and having this happen within the country in the heart of, of the capital city. Yeah. Um, and, and another thing that, that I want to unpack there that I noticed uh, right out is a lot of the films that emanate from Cambodia, a lot of the documentary films 
often deal directly with the genocide. It seems like either in books, either in journals, either in uh, doc films, 90% of the time the material that's being discussed is is really the you know the tragedies of of the 70s and the 80s. And yeah. what your film, what I appreciate, and, and part of that, and, and, and you note this as a filmmaker, is that often we have a number of talking heads who are speaking about the history in the past. And mm. so what's beautiful and really, um, as someone who has spent so much time working in that country and certainly doing doc work myself, something that really jumped out quickly that I really appreciate and I'm really happy to hear that and, and see that you made this pivot. And it's interesting to hear that it was a very conscious decision on your part and on your part is that you really made a decision early on to let to let the Cambodians tell the story you didn't have talking heads coming on and speaking about the history of Cambodia or you didn't have say members of 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 international organizations coming on and giving context for the viewer from the get-go you bring the viewer into your film in a very real and immediate fashion, as if you are there experiencing what has happened on the gr- what is happening on the ground in Cambodia, and I truly I can't really praise you enough for that decision, Chris, because a lot of people would not have been able to come to that decision, and it's a part of what separates a Cambodian Spring for me. It's a part of what separates your film from most any of the other docs that have come out of that of that country. Yeah, I mean, it. it- I, I don't think it was that difficult a decision to make for me in the mm. in the end because I kind of felt like to make to make a film that is this outsider perspective it just felt wrong to me people right. the people that I was filming with you know risked a great deal to allow me to film with them mm. so by being associated with a foreigner when they're fighting for their housing rights against a very corrupt government mm. it can single them out for discrimination and it can mean you know that they're at much greater risk of not getting a home or being evicted or whatever or being imprisoned right. so they've taken great personal risks to allow me into their lives to document the story mm. and it's what I wanted to do then in return was to try and tell the story through their perspective and from That's their right. point of view as much as possible. And so it's, it is very subjective, but I did immerse myself in that world as well. I was there for six years every day filming um, with those people, you know, often without a translator, just me and a camera and a radio mic and a microphone on the camera and that was kind of it like we were just there feeling out what was happening right um and and we spent a year and a half editing the film and we very consciously decided and you know we knew from a structural perspective that we wouldn't have a voiceover and we would we would not fall back on interviews to provide context mm. and we we translated every single piece of footage That's that we right. shot that's right. So into the transcripts and we poured through the transcripts and we worked meticulously to pull out the narrative from the footage that we'd shot, you know, and to, to build a narrative arc on based entirely on the material that we had and to get to try to look at, be able to look at that kind of micro human level as well as the macro geopolitical level at the same time, mm-hmm. all come out of the material that we had. So it was, it took, it was a decision that was easy to make, I feel, but one that was painstaking and difficult right. to execute because it makes the film much more demanding and complex and it also makes the film for the viewer um, more it demands more from the viewer because you have to really pay attention to watch it it's not something where you know you can't predict the end by within the first 10 minutes of the film really <laughs> you really have to watch and pay attention because things develop and if you miss something then you know you're you're kind of you're going to be playing catch up for a while yes yes you're, you're not taking bathroom breaks in watching this film it, it is an edge of your seat type of documentary there's no doubt about it now one thing i want to point out here is that you sort of offhandedly mentioned that you were there for six years i think that we should we should expand upon that a little bit because you, are you saying that you lived in cambodia for six years yeah um i moved there in 2009 mm. uh, to do the film to do the film expressly to make the film initially to stay about three to six months to film the whole thing <laughs> and come out again, you know, with a kind of snapshot view of Cambodia. Yeah. Um, and other filmmakers flew in, you know, and did the same thing. Like there's been other filmmakers over the time that I was there who flew in 
tried to make the same film and flew yeah. out again. And, and you know, the the quality of those films kind of shows. Yeah. In, in it's very relative to the amount of time that was spent there. I think. Um. And but yeah, I mean, you know, I stayed again because I felt a very happy moral obligation to the subjects mm. to stay until their story was finished. Mm. When people offer so much to you and are willing to sacrifice so much and put themselves at risk for you you have an obligation to document then and to stay until the story is done yes uh and you know the land rights story kind of ends is at the the penultimate chapter in the film as, as the story evolves into the political protests that came about after the 2013 elections right. and the reason they're in the film actually is very much because the people involved in those political protests were also deeply involved in the land rights protests. So the you know the work of the Venerable Silvat and the women at Bangkok Lake was instrumental in kind of paving the road and setting the laying the kind of ground works for those political protests to take place. They would never have been possible. Hmm. You wouldn't have seen hundreds of thousands of people out in the street calling for Hun Sen to step down had it not been for the years of protesting and raising awareness that people like the Venerable and the Bangkok community have been doing previously. So it just made sense to stay and keep documenting that, you know. And I'll, actually, as for a filmmaker, I think I was very, very fortunate in that the last thing I ever shot is the last shot of the film. So when Srey Po turned her head away from the camera, wow. I turned the camera off and that was it. I knew at that point story's done now this is this is the end of it like it's this, this is the end of this story as it is mm. yeah and you speak of courage and you speak of of you know being at risk and you're sitting beside a gentleman who can speak to that very very well it's time to turn a little attention to you venerable we talk about security and we talk about risk and we talk about um already in this conversation we've talked about these these things can you, for my audience, can you explain a little bit, in the film, you are often with your camera phone. A lot of the footage that's in the documentary comes directly from what you are filming. In many ways, you are a witness to everything that is going on. Can you explain to us, Venerable, what is that like for yourself as a, as a Buddhist monk in a country like Cambodia, putting yourself out there and you are at these protests and you are supporting the villagers and you're filming. What was that like for you as as a Buddhist monk? And what was that like for you as a filmmaker? Yeah, in Cambodia, you know, many, many problems, especially relating to the uh, politic violation, human rights, abuse, prohibition, land grabbing. So the social problem always happen by corruption or not good uh, leader, not good uh, politics in Cambodia, starting from the Khmer Rouge regime. And till now, Cambodia still suffering more and more again and again mm. because of the the political leader they not respect or following the real democracy mm. or also they not uh, respect or following the real buddhism also so whatever that um become to the monk and all the monk in cambodia were respect from the lay people over 95 percent and everything support, you know, food, accommodation, or right. anything from lay people. So like this, when lay people to get injustice, suffering, prohibition, and they poor, they were arrested uh, by the police authority, accusation from the court, detained in the prison, very, very uh, injustice like this make me uh, very pity on to them. And in the name of Buddhism, in the name of Buddhist monk, so the Buddha said the monk uh, must be to help the people 
to reduce the suffering pain from and suffering right from the nation and then um, um stand up to join with the social justice with uh community with the people to protest to advocacy for justice so uh, like this in Cambodia the first time the the first month that uh, stand up with uh, uh, people to use the social media smartphone yeah. camera to film to film it to uh, sell it to see it because want to help them uh, 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 by you know uh, to help them by the real even real new mm. because in Cambodia the TV radio newspaper so big big media controlled right. by the ruling party by the government that's right so they never broadcasting or release about the real new so like this um, uh, me use it to film it to saw it, to sell it, to sell it, because want to change it, and want to, uh, you know, to to help the people That's for right. justice. I'd like to ask you, Venerable, what was it like when Chris approached you? Um, what was that moment like when Chris approached you with his camera and he started filming you? Because you were filming the events. You were filming people and what was happening on the ground. And then Chris began to film you. What was that like for you? Uh, when Chris uh, followed me, so Chris looked like to sell me continue also because I uh, filmed the people, filmed the community to sell the people. And then uh, the foreigner journalist or filmmaker uh, looked like uh, Chris, this they film, they film me, they follow me, the same, they sell my safety. <laughs> uh, also, because you know, the camera, the smartphone is the empower of the people, not only Cambodia, but in the world also. And also, the police, uh, dictator, uh, leader, dictator. Uh, government always they afraid the independent media uh, real evidence so like this they use violence they use weapon they use uh, the gun again me again the people but i'm not use violence again them but we use the camera or smartphone again them so like this the camera is the empower to change and social media can uh, broadcast, share uh, the real evidence, real information to the social media. So right. the people in Cambodia or in the world, they can see it. So when they can see it, the real evidence like this, they can help uh, the people, the nation, or they can change it also. So like this, yes. um, I'm go everywhere in Cambodia, you know, every day and every night and all the time. I don't have bodyguard and myself, but I have many, many camera. Yes, by camera That's or right. smartphone right. and my hand and my pocket because when I have it, uh, I think that, oh, I look like the the safety, the safety because <laughs> look like have uh, bodyguard, bodyguard around me, bodyguard <laughs> right. from the camera, from the smartphone. For example, when they arrested me. So when they arrested me, I'm just use the small camera from the smartphone to film yeah. the people of the community that they face land grabbing for eviction only, but they accuse me illegal film. That's right. And then they arrested me. So when they arrested me, so many, many uh, foreign uh, journalists, they can film. They can film what? happened and yes. the violation day that they arrested me so 
like this when I saw oh a lot of camera a lot of uh, journalists foreigner filmmaker like this I'm happy I'm happy I'm not <laughs> angry to them although they make violence against me they arrested me but I'm still keep uh, smile still keep happy because I think that the people in the world will see it and will uh, see it and will sing it that's what right. wrong and right. These images tell the truth. Now, Chris, a, a part of what I'd like to kind of talk about now that deals with some of the risk and dangers for doc filmmakers working in environments like this, um, in a in a particularly politically charged environment, um, and you know, I have to say, you know, when I was when I was first doing doc work in Cambodia, I spent six months. This was back in, see, Bipon Bun, yeah, two thousand four, and we were going around the countryside and we were filming. Basically, we were filming vi- villagers who were digging up old mortars, bombs, and rockets. And they were taking these rockets apart, and they were selling the TNT and the scrap metal. And I never once, of course, filming this in itself was a dangerous, it, it's a dangerous activity. And so it, I felt sometimes at risk with what we were filming. But in yeah. terms of being a doc filmmaker in, at that time, operating in a place like Cambodia, it felt like, it felt like uh, it, it was unbelievable because I felt like we had access to almost anything and everything that we asked for, and 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 that was wherever we went throughout the country. That has since been changing, and 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 I I feel like in the past four or five years I've seen a rapid change in that, and I wonder if you noticed it from when you first were filming. And, and then after a few years living there and doing more filming. And, and part of the reason I ask about this is as the, at the time of recording this podcast, tomorrow Aussie filmmaker journalist, um, uh, I think it's James Rickardson, he is set to, to go to trial. And of course, he's been imprisoned for the better part of the last year um, when they, they basically put him away for using a drone and filming protests. And I wonder yeah. how that speaks to you, Chris, because... You are clearly in the middle of some very heated and politically charged environments. So, what I'd like to hear from you, Chris, is what was that like when you were first filming filming that in Cambodia? Did that change, and if so, how? Um, and 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 what were you doing to help with some of the risks um, uh, while you were filming there? Um, I mean, when we arrived in two thousand and nine, we went to the Ministry of Information and got our press passes. Right. And so we were technically allowed to film inside the country. But to be honest, in pretty much the entire time I was there filming, I never really had any issues with the authorities. Mm. They let me do my job pretty mm. much unimpeded. Like if there were pro- protests that turned violent and there was pushing and shoving going on and I was caught up in it, mm. this is the land rights protests, I mean, then they would you know, push you back a little bit. And I was able to kind of push back and say, look, I'm doing my job. You do your job. Just leave me be and like, let's get on with it. Let's be professional. Hmm. And to be honest, for the most part, that was kind of, that was okay. Like they didn't really, no one ever tried to confiscate the camera or tell me that I couldn't film. Hmm. Sometimes around Bangkok Lake in the beginning, like Hmm. because nobody was really documenting the case, you know, the private security guards would, they would follow us around and say, no, you can't film here. This is private property. But like the community would say, well, they're filming me in my house or whatever. Like, it's fine. We, we, we give them consent yeah. or they would phone the local authorities and they would get consent that way. Um, over time, definitely things changed. Like during the political protests in 2013, yes. uh, the authorities started to pay a little bit more attention to what was going on and what people were doing, I think, because they had had so much bad publicity. <laughs> um, so they started to crack down a little bit more on people. But I still, again, was able to 
to operate very freely. The only risk really of harm, I think, was the fact that during the protests, obviously, they were quite violent, and so there was protesters throwing rocks, but the police response was so kind of heavy-handed um, yeah. that they would often respond just by firing live rounds indiscriminately into the crowds, and that's how people were killed that's oftentimes. Right. So there was no kind of escalation process. There was no smoke bombs or um, you know rubber bullets or this kind of thing, stun grenades. They just instantly went straight from... The initial response was to fire live rounds, and so someone was yeah. killed just a few feet away from me because of this. And I guess you're at risk there because the the nature of these kinds of protests are quite chaotic, and there's no clear front line, and you don't know when people are aiming at you or not. Um, but as a target, never really actually. Um, now, part of the reason for that may be that I never actually published anything the entire time I was there, so right. they didn't know what I was doing. So I wasn't like a wire journalist who was going home that night and filing something and, pu and it being published that day or the next day. Right. Though, though you could have been sending out social media, or you could have been blogging about this. Did you consciously not doing that in order to protect yourself we in a way? I mean, we did a little bit of it, but yeah, we okay. kept it fairly off the radar intentionally so okay. as not to draw too much attention to ourselves. Okay, we did right. have trailers and things like that kind yeah. of describing what the film was about so right. they could see that but there wasn't any kind of it wasn't a complete picture of how the film was going to um, end up and you know I was fortunate to be able to do some hostile environment training courses in the UK as well but you know so that kind of helped a lot in terms of understanding how to deal with hostile wow. environments can you can you uh, share um, some of that and how you applied that how you find yourself applying that as a filmmaker in those moments in those environments um, I think it's just about being risk aware and being somewhat risk averse, like not doing things that would be stupid, like trying to make sure that you have colleagues around you and that you're not the only person surrounded by, you know, a hundred military people or that you're at the wrong end hmm. of a protest that you're, you know, there's certain areas that it's quite clear that you shouldn't go. You'd be in the line of sight of fire or something like that of the, of the police or the hmm. army. So just understanding how, I mean, you re, it's a very detailed training that lasts almost a week, so you really have to go through uh, that training process. But I would highly recommend doing something like that. There are organizations that provide free training courses or bursaries for training courses, oh, wow. like the Rory Peck Trust, and I believe there's others in the U.S. as well. Okay. Um, and the, it's really invaluable, not just for the hostile environment training, but also for the medical training that you get as well. And they also do now, I think, trainings on like internet security and that kind of stuff as well. So really, really, really valuable training for anyone who's looking to work in a document, who is looking to create a documentary in any kind of a hostile or slightly oppressive environment. Um, I would highly recommend it. But to get back to what you were asking, I think, you know... No, that's the, great advice, though. Thank you. No, and you're welcome. Um, the, I think the situation is much, much worse now. As you said, James Ricketson's in jail at the moment um, on yeah, fairly trumped up charges yes. of espionage. Interesting use of words there, by the way. <laughs> uh, unintentional, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, a lot of the Cambodian journalists whose footage is in my film are in prison at the minute. Owen Chin from RFA and several others are, um, are in prison just for doing their job. So the the cost of trying to be a journalist in Cambodia is, is really high at the moment. There's no independent media publishing in Khmer or English or any language inside of Cambodia right now after the uh, Phnom Penh Post was sold That's right. recently to a Malaysian firm who works for Hun Sen. Yeah. And obviously, Cambodia Daily was shut down last year. All of the Khmer language radio stations have been shut down, so yeah. it's... Yeah, it's it's a dire um, situation right now for um, freedom of press, freedom of expression. Yeah. Okay. And and so my next question for you is: um, Have you been back to Cambodia since you filmed? And do you plan on going anytime soon? Do you think that you would be wise to go back anytime soon? Yeah, I, I plan to go back. Okay. Um, I'm not sure when or how, and I don't see any reason that I I shouldn't be able to go back to the country. I haven't done anything particularly uh, wrong, I don't think. I think it's a fairly fair portrayal of the situation. I haven't been you know, heavy-handed or um, yeah. particularly didactic in terms of trying to you know, uh, hammer home any sort of message or anything like that. I think the film's somewhat ambiguous in its message in a way. Yeah. 
Um, although if you read between the lines, I'm sure you can get at <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what we think. Um, but yeah, I don't know how much the authorities are reading between the lines. So I'd, I'm hoping that it should be all right. You know, Kevin Doyle, who was the editor of the Cambodia Daily for many years and and on Hun Sen's blacklist and was, yeah. you know, Hun Sen had spoken about publicly before. He's able to travel freely to the country. So I, I'm hoping that okay. I should be able to as well. I brought that up because uh, a, a colleague of mine, Bradley Cox, who, like yourself, lived in Cambodia for a handful of years. He might have been there for five, five or so years. And mm. he did a documentary um, uh, about um, uh, Chia Vichea. Yeah. And, uh, and he is... Um, much more sensitive subject matter that yeah though. yeah and you know much closer to the bone the same as like chut and uh yes. kim lai and things like that those those killings are the government take a much more uh heavy-handed approach to those films and the people behind them than i think this or others like it Venerable, I'd like to ask you another question now. I'm, I'm curious, what happens now, Venerable? Do you consider, are you still filming? Do you consider yourself a filmmaker? Or what is your mission now and where are you doing this? You know, uh, right now the situation in Cambodia is so very, very bad that the government, they, they use the power of politics, yeah, of court, of the everything that they want to clear, you know, to delete, to kill democracy or independent media, NGO, and also including the social media activists like me also. So uh, like this, the situation in 2018, before vote election is coming 29 July 2018. So the government, they delete or destroy everything before vote election uh, like this. Yes. Um, not safety uh, for me or uh, for all you know, the politi opposition, politician, uh, human rights defender, activists, land right, worker right, natural right, activists, yeah, everything were uh, afraid, uh, quiet uh, because of uh, the politics, threaten, politics uh, crackdown. But uh, for me, I'm still forward my activity for uh, symbol of the monk, just model for the Buddhist monk or for the human rights defender activists. So I'm still going on my activity to use uh, uh, social media, to use smartphone camera, to film it, to uh, share it and uh, the social uh, media, all those very difficult things to express the, 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 the media, but um, we still do it. And then uh, we need call for to all democracy country in the world, especially United Nations, that they bring democracy to Cambodia start from 1993 until now 25 years ago. So whatever we are doing to promoting human rights, democracy 25 years ago, many, many people, journalists that uh, working for 
social justice, democracy, or independent media in Cambodia were re-dangerous. Some people die, kill, arrested, injure, or escape from the Cambodia. But uh, step by step, so the Khmer people, they uh, stand up to understand very, very clearly about human rights, about democracy. So right now, they very hungry to see the real justice, real uh, human rights or democracy in Cambodia. So they go to vote for Chen, you know, Chen in 2013. And then uh, 2017, this is the Cambodian spring documentary that we, uh, we think that the Khmer people start to stand up uh, miss, miss people, a million people uh, in Cambodia, they go to vote and vote for Chang already. Vote for Chang already. But the ruling party, they still cheat the Chang. They still use the power of court army politics to control the power especially Prime Minister Hun Sen, he always he said that, oh, he will lead in Cambodia forever. Sometimes he said that, oh, at least a year more he lived in Cambodia. So until now, uh, he lived in Cambodia 33 years ago. Right. But we changed already, Cambodia, we changed from the vote already, but because of the cheat, the change, and then, they organize the vote election again and again, just fake election, not That's free right. and free election. And then uh, right now uh, also. So like this, we call for two international country, especially the Paris Peace Agreement country, United Nations, please help to save democracy in Cambodia. As we sort of wrap up here our conversation, and and I think you're probably would probably be understand this, Chris. I could speak with you for for many hours on the subject, and perhaps when when Steph and I are, are back in the UK, we will be able to meet up and and have that conversation. Yeah, sure. First of all, of course, um, how can we see a Cambodian Spring? I, I understand you're in the middle of a theatrical tour now. Talk talk about that for a moment, and then and then after that, what distribution looks like, so we can all so we can see a Cambodian spring. Yeah, we've been doing um, a theatrical tour in the UK and Ireland since the end of April. The Venerable and I have been traveling around every major town and city in both countries, uh, doing Q and A screenings of the film. That's been going really, really, really well. Actually, we've had like lots of sold out screenings and really engaging and interesting conversations and lots of like Cambodia scholars and academics and activists and people who've been there before or whatever, you know, people with an interest in the country, they all kind of come out to the screenings and we've had Q&As have gone on for well over an hour and turned into like a whole kind of debate within the room and stuff, you know, so it's been really, it's been really rewarding in that sense to kind of get the film out there and having audiences respond so well to it and, and so kind of enthusiastic about the film and you know, people say they had no idea like that these kind of things were going on in Cambodia, but also a lot of people take away like the kind of universal themes that run through it, um, yeah. you know, corrupting nature of power and the uncomfortable relationship between the church and state and, you know, like kind of what it costs to stand up for something that you believe in and fight for something that you believe in, the kind of the human cost of being an activist. I think these are all things that people sort of anywhere involved in activism can um, can understand and relate to so it's been good for people to see the universal kind of themes that are inherent in the, in the film's message um, and in terms of where it's going next there's a few things in the pipeline we nothing's confirmed yet so I mean we're looking there's a there's a few things that we're looking at trying to do you know we're looking at all of the Khmer diaspora and say so we're trying to connect it to as much of the Cambodian people around the world as we can. Of you know, we're, we're focusing 
very hard on getting the film seen by the Khmer diaspora in as many countries as possible. So we're looking at getting it out in, you know, France and Switzerland and Belgium and in Europe and obviously Australia, yeah, Australia as well. Yeah. Yeah, Australia, the US and Canada, North America. Um anywhere where there's a strong Khmer community, we'd really like the film to have a presence and, and to be widely seen. And it'll be available on various online platforms later in the year. We'll have more details about that very soon. Okay, um, great. We'll post as much of that as we can, certainly, in the show notes for this episode. But as more information comes in, um, yes. we will be able to update that as well. And we'll That's obviously great. continue sharing information on social media. Chris, I'd love to hear some final sort of, if you would, share us maybe some final words of wisdom. And I want you to speak to speak to that doc filmmaker um, like yourself, who is truly, I mean, you truly were living the doc life. I mean, you're living in Cambodia. You made a conscious decision to live there for six years, to immerse yourself, embed yourself in what is happening in the communities and to film and to live there. What can you tell us in terms of, give us give us some inspiration, if you will. No pressure, by the way. Give, <laughs> give us some kind of recommendation or inspiration in what can help us get through some of those trying times where we think, you know what? I just, I, I can't do this. To, and I can't do this anymore. I've been working on this film for too long. I don't have the resources any longer. I, I've got to go live this idea of a normal life. Tell us how we can, how we can stay within our doc lives and keep staying true to ourselves in our doc projects i've been making this project for 25 percent of my waking life so <laughs> uh there's definitely you have to be committed to the story and to the idea you have to care about it like it has to be the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning and the last thing you think about before you go to bed at yeah. night you can't think about it as being something that's going to make you any money because it isn't. Uh, it's something that you do because you care passionately about it and because it's a story that you you want to tell and that you hope. I, I mean, I had I had to hope that people would care about the story as much as I cared about it or that at least the things that I found there would resonate in some kind of meaningful and profound way with audiences. And it's been we've been very fortunate in that it has done that. And the stories that we found uh had enough of a universal theme to them that it's resonating with audiences all over the place not just audiences who have an understanding of Cambodia or you know or who are interested in the issues so I think for me it was about making the story as universally relevant as possible making it about the human condition it's not an activist film it's a film about activism it's a film about human beings you know it's a film about hope and aspirations and and standing up and fighting for what you believe in so it's it, you have to care so passionately about the subject and what you're doing and believe in what you're doing and mm -hmm. just I, I i don't know I mean, I wanted to give up many, many times. You know, the funding was, was almost non-existent. We had almost no funding whatsoever, mm -hmm. um, which other than the development money that we had. So we relied on some small crowdfunding campaigns and the help of friends and family occasionally. And I invested a lot of money that I'd earned elsewhere working as a journalist in the region. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you know, I was only able to do this because Cambodia is quite affordable to live and there's a lot of other work you can find in the region. So I could tread water and be based there yeah. you know so you have to make you have to be prepared to make a lot of lifestyle sacrifices if you want to do something like this but i think there's a direct correlation between the amount of time you spend on something and the quality of the material that you get out of it at the end um but don't be afraid to you know make difficult choices as well at the end of the day in the editing room i made so many difficult choices and in fact the character that I care about the most is not in the film. Wow. <laughs> so there's a whole extra story that, that, that I shot from a, in a separate location in Phnom Penh that never made it into the film because it didn't serve the film well. Her story was just too separate. So uh, even though it was always my intention that she would be part of it, um, <laughs> she had to be prepared to make very difficult decisions and sacrifices and be prepared to listen to other people as well and right. when they when they give you advice and when you're working like filmmaking is a collaborative art form uh but i think just yeah i i guess i believed in myself as well and that that, that the film had integrity and that we had a an approach that was 
intelligent and that we treated our audience with intelligence. So, yeah, I think the more people embrace the complexity and the, the ambiguity um, and, you know, reject these oversimplifications of life, then the better films will be for it. Don't fly in and fly out again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had the distinct pleasure of speaking with filmmakers Chris Kelly and Venerable Loon Sovat. Gentlemen, anyone who has been listening to this program know uh, what a dear uh, uh, and important and um, incredible conversation that this this has been for me. And so uh, I want to thank you so much for that personally. And I also think that there is an immense amount of uh, valuable information here for doc filmmakers. Thank you so much, gentlemen. The film is a Cambodian spring. Chris Kelly and Venerable Luan Sabat, it's been a pleasure. Okun Tran, and thank you so much for being on The Documentary Life. Okun Tran, thank you very much. Uh, that's been a pleasure as well. The Venerable, he's just run off to the toilet, I'm afraid. <laughs> perfect. That is absolutely perfect. Well, you, you'll you tell him I said goodbye and, and, and thank I you will, so much. I will, of course. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, Chris. All, All right. the best. Yeah, take care. Don't forget, if you're interested in a guide to help you navigate the fundamental aspects of doc filmmaking, the things that every doc filmmaker should know, then get our free doc filmmaking course, The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist, by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next episode. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.